refreshing to see so many of you here tonight. Tonight has been a celebration of just a few of our heroes. Drink, be merry, and dance the evening away. Good night to you all. Thank you. With an ICU, we knew something was coming and we started preparing for it in the February. It's a respiratory disease. We know how to treat this. And you recognise what's happening abroad and you think to yourself, well, they're just not getting it right. We'll be OK. And then one became two, became four, became ten. And then you realise that it's actually happening here and we're right in the middle of it. It very clearly became obvious that it was a multi-organ condition and a lot of the conventional treatments that we'd always relied on didn't work. Your bees to a honeypot just desperately trying to learn. I was in touch with people in Italy, France. We were learning the drug regimes, we were learning proning. It was a huge weight of responsibility. I was really feeling completely overwhelmed and not being able to control things in the way that I normally do and seeing all of our normal structures that do control things falling apart. It changed everything in the hospitals, from even walking down the corridor to having lunch, to seeing your colleagues and looking after patients. Planned surgery to put on hold. We have to explain to those patients why that's happening. But people still fall, crash their cars. That service has to be maintained and be functional. So how do you maintain a safe patient services with the resources you have. How many staff can we lose? Who's going to get sick? Who covers me if I'm ill? How do we get medicines up to the wards? Drug charts back and forth. And there came a point when you realised that actually the whole way that we were working just needs to change. So every specialty, every part of the hospital had to restructure their service. At the same time, if there were rising cases of COVID within the hospital, that meant it was rising in the local community, and that's where we all live. How am I going to keep my kids safe? I'm coming to work, and work is where these patients are going. I do remember my family saying, should you be going to work? I don't think you should go to work. You don't need to go to work. Please don't go to work. And I said, yes, I have to go. It's my role, I'm a key worker, and I'm making a difference, and it's important. The day that everyone will remember will be Mother's Day in 2020, when the NHS in London was asked to plan for the most significant increase in critical care beds. I drove through central London, and there's nobody there. Broad daylight, nobody there. No lights on in the offices, no coffee shops, no one on the streets. You can see all this architecture, you can hear the birds, but it felt like the soul had been taken out. It was very eerie taking the train to work, and usually it would be standing room only. I even took a photograph because it, it felt so surreal. But actually, when you came into work, then um, you weren't in lockdown. It was very much, everything is completely manic. But there was this feeling of safety in a space that you knew. We allowed people to innovate because we had no option. They showed that courage to take decisions that were way outside of their comfort zone. And because of that, we saved a lot of people. Everybody, even those who didn't have any ICU background, they had transferable skills and we could utilise that. Overnight, we had to redeploy basically the entire staff of surgery. We moved them to a completely alien environment. Really showed huge resilience then and a lot of bravery, I think, really, because it was putting people in really uncomfortable situations. So I think for us it was how do we get through each day, but also how do we get them through each day. We became almost a single disease hospital, and the difficulties of staffing and running a hospital like that was immense. About the 8th of April 2020, I was bracing myself to come back to Newham, but I remember being really, really scared. I was 15 weeks working in intensive care. 
to me, it even now, it was a, it was a, it was a hard time. Our staff room was like a massive, just offloading area. No one would ever understand what you were going through the same way that your colleagues would. And then you'd be like, right, come on girls, like, we, we've got to go again now. Medicines is an integral part of every patient's journey, particularly ITU patients. All of a sudden, you had a lot of patients all needing the same medicines. And so that became um, a huge problem. We deal with the ventilators. We just needed so many repairs, so many installations. Some of the things, even the things, the negative things you don't want to think about, it will still stick with us and we will just learn from it and remember it for the rest of my life. Extraordinary situations are not simple to deal with and there were times when people felt exposed, felt unable to cope, but somehow each team and each site managed to pull together and that was only because everyone looked after each other. You could not help but see the impact of the social determinants of health. It brought home to all of us, if we weren't already aware, how much equity in healthcare matters. We had stark data that confirmed what we were seeing, what we were hearing from colleagues. Those from black and Asian minority ethnic groups were being were disproportionately affected, but also had poorer outcomes. That was extremely hard. It wasn't just that, it happened that intersection with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the murder of George Floyd. There was this heightened consciousness of what I knew existed, but then it was right there in your face and you couldn't get away from it. There are issues of discrimination, there's statistics, there's evidence. Let's do something about it now, as opposed to just sweeping it under the carpet. Let's do something. And I felt that change. And I think when Alwyn championed the equality and diversity agenda, putting it in as a trust objective, that makes a difference. When somebody applies for a job, they apply for work in an area that they want to work in. They apply for something that they're comfortable doing. But with the pandemic, you're not given a choice of where you're going to go. It was hard, but you wanted to be part of the response. Because you've got to get involved. That's the thing you, I got straight away, that irrespective of how I felt about it, I got to help sick people. That's my primary function. It's not about me anymore. It's about the community. It's about paying for the species, aren't we, with the pandemic? I was a newly qualified nurse working on a trauma ward. And then the pandemic hit. Unfortunately for me, I, I'm one of the clinically vulnerable people, so I ended up getting told, you know, um, you're going to have to shield. No one really knew what to do with me, and I didn't really know what to do with myself. I went back to uni to study to be a nurse um, because I wanted to help people. Suddenly, I'm feeling like I'm letting the team down. I've ended up getting into the events team. At least with this Over the Rainbow event, I'm helping create something that will thank all the members of staff. I did a lot over lockdown to expend a lot of stressful energy out of work. So I decorated my flat. Um, I started watercolouring. I started rewatching 24. I went back to uh, cross stitching. You can see. I did learn how to do Pilates on Zoom. I've been singing since I was 12 years of age with my friend Larry. I am practically a stranger. I couldn't get to Plymouth to sing with him. So we started doing videos and we put it on Facebook. Walking, going out, exercising. I hadn't done very much of that. May the 1st, I got my Brompton bike and I started to cycle. Now, 17 months on, I am cycling nine miles through three burrs. It has names in the back of the people that donated the bike. It was a bad time in, in my life, but I, I achieved. I had some friends who sent me some sunflowers and I wasn't expecting it. Little things like that out of the blue made me realise who I really care for and who really cares back. In an odd kind of way, it allowed a lot of time and space to reflect as an individual and as a family on what our real priorities were. Because I've been a single parent and I worked, I enjoyed, you know, 
catching up with the lost time with, with my fast-growing son. I think I have had a tendency to put work first before family and um, so one of the legacies I will take away is, is to ensure that I've got that work-life balance um, that works for everybody. We perhaps never really thought on such a grand scale about perhaps the flexibilities that, you know, work-life can have. With these new technologies of video meetings that we do on MS Teams, it saves a lot of time and we don't have to keep rescheduling meetings. So some of us can actually be on MS Teams and while others can actually physically come in if they prefer to. What I quite enjoyed was we had to learn the new skills. We had to produce videos both for patients and for staff. And instead of being in contact with a limited amount of patients, I was in contact with a, a large number. I attended um, a couple of memorial services for members of staff we'd lost. And trying to offer words of comfort to a young family who've lost a parent is really difficult. And then when you go home that evening, you kind of just want to give your own kids a, a bigger hug. This is a very difficult time. Even your children are, you know, is scared of you because you are working in the hospital and sometimes you want to hug them and there's a little, there's quite a, a little bit hesitant, you know, and it's quite painful. I have a little two-year-old and everybody else, all they want is to talk about, oh, is work bad? Are the COVID numbers bad? She didn't care about COVID and she didn't care about the numbers or how ill the patients were. She just cared about if I was going to play with her or not. She was a lot of the motivation to like be me as well as the nurse me. My son and my daughter would always ring every day to make sure I was right. Most of my days were spent saying that to everyone else. And that really was, you know, that, that was, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Probably one of the, the big things for us was trying to create one of the largest critical care units in the country. We could see the numbers increasing. We needed this unit. Normally projects like that take years. We did that all in six weeks. All the people who were involved in that were really positive about the outcome. What we have there is a legacy of critical care beds for the future. Barts Health then was asked to set up and operationalise the Nightingale. And that was a terrifying, wonderful, amazing experience, uh, coming together with a group of people. IT, to estates, to clinicians and nurses, uh, so many people just running towards danger. And although the Nightingale Hospital didn't treat an enormous number of patients, thankfully that was one of the success stories. What it did do was symbolise, I think, what the NHS was there to do and that we, we would do whatever was necessary. You really felt in the darkest of days that everyone was rooting for the NHS and and that made a huge difference. It was extraordinary. You've got this swell of people genuinely wanting to help. Veterinary services with gowns and masks, the food parcels, the hot meals for the teams, the coffee stops and the ice cream vans that, that popped in. Across the country, people were clapping on the doorstep. For most of my career, my family and my friends haven't really had a clue what I do. Friends and family were calling in to ask if you're okay, make sure you look after yourself at work. It was nice to see that in a moment of crisis, the vast majority of people really rallied around in an extremely positive way. I was working in a garage actually. I've seen it all over the TV and yeah. news every day how many people have sadly passed away and I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to, to be honest, just to be there for everyone. I thought to contribute to the community as a volunteer and spread happiness all over. We should do extraordinary. No, small things, small steps can also matter. You felt that not only were you starting to actually make a difference, but we were feeling that in the feedback that was coming back from the staff at the hospital. Volunteering has kept me going through the pandemic. It made me have somewhere that I can go and see people face to face rather than over Teams or Zoom which had made, because I live on my own. So the first lockdown was awful for me. I've had both my parents pass away in here. And I thought that would put me off, but in fact, it's built the bond stronger. I really want to give back and give the support and love that the nurses and doctors gave to my own parents.
I had coronavirus, but I had to go to a separate unit in the hospital. The patients who were doing dialysis that had COVID. The nurses, they were very calm. And you know what? They got us through it. Every bit of information they were getting, they were telling us, I'm back home. I'm with my family. I'm with my grandson. I've got a granddaughter on the way any day now. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here now. My mother went in for a planned surgical procedure. Unfortunately, there were some underlying issues with her own health that um, nobody was aware of, and she um, had to be um, intubated. So she was in an induced coma for three weeks. The communication hub was one of the best things that, that BARTS did through that time. We knew what was happening at a time where we couldn't be there and it meant everything. I got to the hospital. I didn't notice any kind of change between morale. And it's very difficult because people are wearing masks, but you, you know when people are smiling under that mask. Life was difficult and complicated. We had to close the churches, the mosques, the temples. There were so many rumours and myths and things going around. There was a lot of fear and anxiety because they couldn't see. They didn't know what was going on. And in the absence of information, people had just jumped towards Facebook and WhatsApp, whatever it was, and listened to nonsense. And yet the people who had the information were not in a position to communicate that effectively. They, they, they didn't have the cultural competence or the reach into community to have those conversations. And then I was emailed to say, would I be interested in joining the BART's Faith and Community Group? We would meet up once a week, local councillors, faith group leaders, and also hospital representatives, and ask those experts about what is happening. It meant that we could communicate reliable, safe and trustworthy information. We were kind of reassuring families about the healthcare that they were getting and also providing kind of spiritual and uh, religious care. I think I lived on adrenaline for about three, four months. At times I've kind of blocked certain bits out of it because they were so draining. Bart's Trust reached out to us when the cafeterias and the restaurants were closed down and all their staff were working long shift hours. We ended up doing over 1,800 meals per day to hospitals, vulnerable, homeless, etc. By working with Bart's, providing those hot meals, through that came trust. So when the end of life calls were being made to families, the hospital let us reach out to families to do group video calls, to say their goodbyes. We want to tackle stigma, particularly within mental health. It's very difficult for people to even acknowledge the sort of um, stresses and troubles that they're encountering. So what we want to do with BART is to be able to tackle that stigma within the community. The pandemic has taught me a lot about myself and my own mental health. I think at the start of the pandemic, I struggled a lot with health anxiety. That was quite a new phenomenon for me, and I think it's probably a new phenomenon for a lot of people. You can't help being anxious. It's one of those things that your body decides that's what you're going to do and you'll do it. I was looking after the people I was working with who we were the redeployed staff, but there were occasions whereby I had to stop and think and ask myself who's going to look after me. I am generous and I give to other people, but I ignore me. I don't bother, I don't take the 10 minutes to go and have a cup of coffee on my own or to go for a walk or read a book. Like I felt so lonely. I could go Monday to Friday without seeing anyone except for the people in the supermarket. If we say to people you need to reach out, it puts the responsibility of someone who's suffering on them rather than having the awareness or the communication skills to be able to reach in and say to them, how are you doing? Use the Ask Twice rule. Psychologists help teams with debriefing after difficult incidents or simply with reflection sessions. And I think that's been a really positive change and getting the investment from the charity to have a permanent team of psychologists available for staff as well as patients, I think is, is critical. 
This is a, a moment in time where we can make a real difference for our staff. People finally acknowledge that actually we give great care when we give great care to our staff. A key part of protecting people's well-being is that they need to be able to feed that desire for altruism that we all have within us, um, but they also need the time to be selfish. We've had fabulous um, donations from Bart's charity that have helped us to upgrade some of the staff facilities. We've set up wellbeing hubs. We want those wellbeing hubs to be a permanent feature of the hospitals as a bit of a statement of a gratitude for all of the service that they've given. Something that I've taken away from this past year has definitely been the importance of music. Times of crisis and suffering really highlight how important things that bring us together are. I'd, I'd love there to be more music in these places. You know, you don't often have time for that kind of thing. You know, I think that's the danger with hospital environments. They can end up being very functional. It's just emphasising the humanity, I think, in these, in these clinical spaces. We were told to get ready before the vaccines were announced, so we didn't actually know what the impact would be. We just knew that, yes, we had to get this vaccine into as many arms as possible. We were stuck in this holding pattern of lockdown and waves going nowhere. And this was a promise of a better day. I led on the pharmacy operational role of the vaccines within the four hospitals. We thought it was something we would need to put in place for January, um, and I got a meeting request on a Sunday afternoon saying actually we're going live on Tuesday and what that meant was we had 48 hours to pull it together and we did. As the vaccine was being developed you also heard the rumblings of people saying I don't really I'm not sure about this. A lot of communities were suspicious of a, of a, of a new drug so it's, it's something that, the, that Bart's really took on board and understood quite rapidly. So we immediately knew that the national program is not enough if people don't want to come to us, we'll take the vaccine to them. We would upskill our staff about doing um, vaccine hesitancy conversation with a member of public. And we've vaccinated the homeless, your asylum seekers, any population that is lost in the system. In many ways, the second peak was worse for many, many reasons. It was about a 40% increase in numbers, but we'd learnt a lot as, in terms of what we needed to do. So we had pharmacists working within ITU. The nurses were working under phenomenal amounts of pressure and everything pharmacy could do to make that that bit easier was, was critical and important. I was managing the workforce hub and we put out a call for volunteers to go and support with critical care. People from all grades volunteered to go and work at a weekend. I did do a few shifts as a healthcare assistant. Just personally, it was humbling to do the job and realise just how hard the job is when you work as a healthcare assistant and how important a role it is. And also very uplifting to see the compassion that people were showing to strangers, you know, this is the, what we call the needs of strangers and the way we respond to it is um, deeply moving if you observe it close hand. I remember being in ITU quite a few times and a patient would kind of suddenly pass away and the, you know, the nurse would be affected, emotionally affected. And I think about it, there's no connection between the nurse and, and the patient, but they felt a kind of responsibility of looking after that person as just as if, as if one of their family members. It was a privilege to see the amazing job that they did. The hopeless, helpless stares, the tiny smiles, hidden behind those frightened eyes. The guilt as I have the strength to walk away. As nighttime falls, as day begins, the monotony for you never ends. The eyes the very window to the soul, yet no story can be told. It's important for everyone to find a way of releasing their feelings and processing their emotions. Wrapped up in the NHS blue to protect me from you. The hope some of my love, compassion and care shows through. The team spirit and the wartime mentality was just huge. I marvel and will never forget the lives saved, the taken ones 
and pray the occurrence of this twice does not beget us thrice. People died and our colleagues died, but there were over 4,000 people we got home. You've got to realise every single member of staff in every single department has worked for the greater good. It was nice how everyone kind of just um, helped each other out, regardless of their job title and their grades and what department they worked in. For that period, everybody kind of worked for one department. Before COVID, you wouldn't class the domestic cleaner as a key worker. You wouldn't address the maintenance man as a key worker, but all of a sudden, I've come part of the team and in a way, I was happy because I was like, yeah, I work in a hospital, key worker. I felt like a bit of a superhero. <laughs> I know that I've played a vital role because had it not been security, the virus would be like, it spread more. Yeah, I'm feeling happy to save life. We're all putting in a shift. At home or here, everybody was working, everybody cared. We all formed a chain, each of its links. There were strong links. All our hospitals were running flat out. Then we started to see the numbers decreasing and I can't express the sense of just sheer relief. We worked with a real compelling purpose in whatever phase and I'm immensely, immensely proud. There's a sort of modesty around, well, we're just doing our jobs, but of course it was so much more. There was no talk of job plans or job descriptions. You thought people had got to the end of what they could give, they just found more. I mean, I knew that they were good, I didn't know they were that good. I actually spent the last nine months working from home, and in the last month we've actually been able to come into the hospitals for the first time, which has just been so good. Let's start opening the service up in a cautious way. The noise and the busyness of the postnatal ward returned. Now you know a lot more people in the hospital, a lot more people are more visible, you kind of, it's, there's not so many kind of faces that are strangers anymore. Some people were in my unit that I might have sat quite near but I didn't know who they were before and they wouldn't have known me. I'll never forget the people I was working with, this, particularly this last year. You know, I just feel proud to be part of what my trust and what we've done. I really want to just to carry on and just make my team, my family, the public proud as, as I can. If we break down some of those little silos and we, we step out of our comfort zone and we leave our tribe and go speak to those people across the hallway, we just work better. There is a Maya Angelou quote, which is, do the best you can until you know better, but once you know better, do better. And this year's been the epitome of that. Because of the uncertain things that happen to us, we become more uh, compassionate, more sensitive to the needs of your colleagues. I can see more kindness came in the people. Everyone now become approachable. And I wish everyone can carry on this in, in, their, in their habit. But we are very forgetful people. We, we forget things very quickly. We need people to celebrate what they've achieved by sharing it with others. So we need to get out and share that story of our learning and the difference it's made in five and ten years time our teams will be the teams that are teaching they will take all of this learning and be the generation that tackled the the pandemic and learnt on the hoof it's been a horrible experience in so many ways but it's also given us a significant catalyst to make enduring clinical changes it's given us the tools to reframe our approach and it's not just about COVID, it's about everything we do about public health and healthiness. Now we're having discussions about what does the right model look like? And we have over here the art of the possible. Um, and we have on the other side what it was like before. But certainly we're, we're much more closer to, to the art of the possible. <laughs>